Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a sociology student who is doing research on the town's new community centre and a resident. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, excuse me. Could you spare a minute, please? Oh, hello. Sorry, I was in a world of my own. I didn't hear you there. No problem. My name's Katie, and I'm a second-year sociology student. We're doing a research project on the importance of community centres to local residents. May I ask, are you a resident of Moulton? The answer is community centres. So, community centres has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, excuse me. Could you spare a minute, please? Oh, hello. Sorry, I was in a world of my own. I didn't hear you there. No problem. My name's Katie, and I'm a second-year sociology student. We're doing a research project on the importance of community centres to local residents. May I ask, are you a resident of Moulton? Yes, I am. That's perfect. Would you mind answering some questions about the facilities you use? It, it won't take very long. Of course. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Far away. Oh, great. <laughs> OK. The first questions are to do with you, so can I ask how old you are? We need to know for statistical purposes later. Well, <laughs> I'd like to say 16, but uh, I'm 59. 60 next week, in fact. Oh, congratulations for next week. Um, now I just need your postcode, and then we'll get started. Right. Well, that's an easy one. It's H-A-8-7-U-P. 7A8HQP. Was that right? No, my dear. It's HA87UP. Right. <laughs> OK. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> That's quite all right. Now, what about these questions? Yes, let's get started. So, one of the most important things we need to know is which of the facilities you already use. Right, OK. OK. What about computer facilities? Do you currently use public computers anywhere in town? Yes, I do. I go to my local library. Great. Uh, just jotting that down. OK. What about local sports facilities? Yes, I get down to the swimming pool at least twice a week. And education facilities? Are you currently attending any courses? Yes, I go to Spanish classes every Friday at the Further Education College. <laughs> That's great. I, I must say, you're very active. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, 
we're halfway through. The next bit is all about how the community centre could be improved, if at all, that is. I see. Well, I'll give it a go. Well, firstly, I'd like to find out your views on sports facilities. Which sports do you think the community centre should offer that it doesn't already? Hmm. Well, I'm not going to say swimming, as there's no point having two pools in a town of this size. Let me think. Um, what about yoga? I know it's very popular these days. Yes, yoga and badminton. I used to play, you know. Really? Yes, and I was quite good, though I'm probably a bit rusty now. It's been years. <laughs> OK. Do you think the classes should be split into groups? Yes, that's a good idea. I know that if there were classes only for pensioners, I'd definitely be more likely to play. I'm not as fast as I once was, you know. <laughs> OK, I'll just write that down. Great. Now we're nearly done. I just need to ask you some questions about education. What kind of classes do you think the centre should offer that it doesn't already? Well, I suppose the kind of thing that's no longer offered at the local college. Um, things like arts and crafts. Those kinds of classes have now closed as they weren't financially viable, apparently. Yes, I heard about that. It was such a shame. Those kinds of classes are so important for the psychological well-being of those most vulnerable in a community. OK, I've written that down. Now I need to ask you whether you would be willing to pay for any of the services we were just talking about. Um, as long as it wasn't too much, I have nothing against contributing. Something like two pounds per class seems like a reasonable rate for an old man like me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, and lastly then, I just need to know how regularly you think you will use the new facilities if the community centre makes the changes you have suggested. Well, I'd say three times a week, which is more than I go at the moment. I only bother on Mondays and Wednesdays, as there's nothing else on during the week that interests me. But I would definitely get out of the house more if they were to make those kinds of changes. That is the end of Section 1. Section 2. You will hear an audio tour for Hampstead in the City of London. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi and welcome to the Walking Audio Tour Service, which offers guided audio tours of over 30 walks around London. The full list of the walks is available on our website. You have chosen the Hampstead Heath Tour Part 1, which was, in fact, the first of the walking tours that were recorded. Your walk takes you through part of the heath, a huge, wild, open parkland where Londoners and visitors to the city can come and enjoy some leisurely and refreshing exercise. The heath is one of the gems of North London. When you enter the parkland, you will feel as if you are walking in the wild countryside, but you are actually still in an urban area. The walking tour begins here at the exit to Hampstead Underground Station, which is the deepest station on the London Underground system. We hope that you enjoy your experience, whether you are on your own or sharing your walk with a companion. So, let's begin your tour. We hope you enjoy it. If you turn right as you exit Hampstead Station and stay on the right-hand side of the road, the main thoroughfare, Heath Street, will take you up the hill to the Heath itself. You are now walking away from the main shops and cafes in Hampstead Village, 
but you can return to visit these after your walking tour for some window shopping. The village is busy during the daytime and the evenings. Now back to Heath Street. As the road winds northwards up Heath Street, you will pass some shops and restaurants on your way to the Heath. When you reach the top, the first part of the Heath that you will see on your right is the Vale of the Heath, which has some spectacular houses built on the Heath itself beside a large pond. If you go along a little further, you will come to a fork in the road, where one road, North End Way, turns to the left and goes northwest away from the heath. And on your right is Spaniards Road, which turns northeast, cutting through the parkland. Walk along this latter road a little way and look for the first opening on your right, where a path leads you down into the wild parkland. As you descend along the pathway, you will find that the noise of the busy road that is just on your left disappears completely. You might want to take off your headphones to enjoy the delight of the sounds of the parkland. Don't imagine that there is only silence. There is the noise of the trees and the wildlife that lives there. As you walk along the path, you will come across several paths coming from the right to join the path that you are on. But keep going until you come to the first fork in the path. Now take the path that goes to your left, which will bring you shortly to the open spaces around Kenwood House. Before you hear the rest of the audio tour, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. You can either walk through the woods and enjoy being among the trees, or you can savour the other charms the heath has to offer. You are now at Kenwood House, which is a museum open to the public. It has been used as the setting for several well-known films and is used as a venue for a wide range of functions. For some light refreshments, there is the cafe at Kenwood House. Below Kenwood House itself, you can see the grassy slopes, which are an ideal place for picnics and for children to run around and play games. Just beyond this picnic area is an open-air stage where music concerts are held in the summer months. You might even see the stage being prepared for a concert while you are there. You might want to explore this part of the heath at your leisure. But before you leave the heath altogether, there are two other notable features that are worth visiting. On the east side of the heath are several large ponds for segregated and mixed bathing. And if you would like a view of London, you can visit Parliament Hill, which gives you a good panorama of London that is in fact protected by law. That is the end of Section 2. Section 3. You will hear a tutor talking to a student about a case study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, 
Am I bothering you? Is it okay to see you now? Hi, Jack. No bother. Please come in. As you're a tutor this year, it's my responsibility to oversee your assignments. Now, where are my notes? Oh, yes, here they are. Okay. I see that we were going to look at your case study on the challenges of urban planning in the 21st century and how to make it as green as possible. How's it all going? Actually, I'm pretty happy with it. Can I talk you through it to make sure I'm on the right track? Of course, please do. I'll stop you if I have any questions. OK. Well, I started by giving an overview of what green urban planning has been up until now. Firstly, there's the idea of a green belt. This is the one that everyone's heard of. But I found that while it was successful for a short time and in limited cases, it grossly oversimplified things. Well, that's a good and practical start. Um, what else did you look at? I hope that you also considered the idea of decentralization. Yes, that was really interesting, as although there were no objections to it, and it looked good on paper, it just didn't work in practice. Yes, a conundrum indeed. However, I think you'll find that there are many fads that come and go in this area. It isn't the first, and it won't be the last to simply disappear off the face of the planet. Well, this is all very good so far. What did you look at next? I then researched the 1960s fad of building new towns on new sites, but I found that although there are isolated cases of success, they tended to cost too much time and money to build. Keeping to that theme, have you considered the idea of brownfield sites? That is, sites that previously had another use being converted into residential areas. Like the idea of buildings that were once banks being turned into restaurants, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. No, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I'd say it's a pretty important option in most urban areas today. Even though there have been issues with safety, if the land were contaminated in any way, at least it tends to attract no objections from local residents. OK, thanks. I'll make sure I put that in. Anything else? Well, I'm not sure about this last one, but I thought the idea of pedestrianizing central areas was an interesting concept. Do you think it's valid here? Well, it's certainly not a bad idea. The only thing is that it would probably intensify the problem of congestion in inner city areas and would disrupt local residents' sleep if the construction work were to happen during the night. The use of loud excavators to repave the area would be inevitable. Yes, I take your point. But in some older cities, I think it's one of the few viable options. Well, as long as you state that, then it can definitely be included. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, so that's my introduction to urban planning sorted. But now I come to the main part, which is the case study. It was really difficult to choose, as there are so many good examples. But in the end, I settled on Curitiba, which is the capital of the South Brazilian state of Paraná. Ah, yes, nice choice. How's the research coming along? Well, to be honest, I'm finding the amount of material a bit too much. There's such a diverse range of statistics that it makes it almost impossible to be selective. Well, tell me a bit more about what you've discovered, and then we'll see if we can come up with a plan to tackle the problem. Well, it's fascinating. Local authorities managed to achieve so much since the 1960s, principally because, rather than waiting for central government initiatives, they chose a cohesive strategy where residents were consulted. Then they took their ideas and implemented them into local government planning to come up with a plan everybody was happy with. Uh-huh. A bottom-up approach. Do go on. 
Well, the transport system is a real example of the town's eco-friendly image. Even though they have one of the highest number of cars per person in the country, they also have the highest number of people using public transport. This is because poor and elderly residents are able to benefit from a social fare that allows them to use the system for less. This has led to low levels of pollution, which also encourages citizens to use bicycles more. Well, that's really impressive, Jack. Well done. But I do have some suggestions to help you with finalising your case study. Please. If you're going to prove Kurichiba's success, you need to refer to specifics. You mentioned pedestrian-only areas in your introduction. How about that? Yes, OK. And what about the amount of parking for all of those cars? I didn't come across that in my research, but I can look it up. Yeah, I think it's important. And what about considering where people live in relation to their place of work? If they live in the suburbs, how about mentioning how far they need to travel in order to get to work? And don't forget about their recycling strategy including how easy it is and how much they recycle, making sure you include statistics to back it up. OK, got it. All in all, Jack, you've really done your homework, and I very much look forward to receiving your final draft. Thanks, Professor. You've been a great help. That is the end of Section 3. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk to economic students about how to make the most of their course. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Stanley University School of Economics. I will be one of your lecturers on the course, and my name is Professor Whitefield. Before the academic year really gets underway, I would like to take you through some of what you can expect and to give you some general course information. Firstly, you'll be attending lectures during which you will receive information about economics and the priorities that you will need to focus on. The lectures will provide you with information about the subject in a relatively condensed format. In addition, they should also provide a suitable framework for further study. Typically, this is also the first time that students get the chance to meet a researcher at the forefront of the discipline. Traditionally, lectures are seen as an essential part of the learning culture for higher education, in which undergraduate study is viewed as an induction into academic discipline and a way of viewing the world. However, although all I have said until now is true, Every year, undergraduate students experience problems with the techniques used in lectures. Being forewarned will hopefully help you with adjusting to these issues. The first problem is that there is little opportunity for the development of student understanding. That is, if you misunderstand something, there is no immediate opportunity to ask. Secondly, when newer teaching approaches are used, such as problem solving, learning outcomes are improved. However, these will still not replace the validity of listening and learning from an expert. Now, before you start despairing, there are several things that you can do in order to make the learning process and consequently your student life at the university easier. First and foremost, 
Be prepared. You will be given a reading list. Don't just throw it away or forget about it. Make sure you leave enough time to go through all items on it. Once you've done that, an ideal thing to do would be to test yourself on the contents. Prepare a, a mini quiz while reading and go back to it before the lecture and just check you know the answers. Now, for most of you, this won't be the first time that you're studying economics, but you may have taken a gap year or had a, a period of time working. If this is so, and even if it isn't in fact, it always makes sense to go back and refresh your memory on those relevant theories you learned about before, as we'll definitely be referring to them. Okay, there are just a, a couple more ideas I'd like to suggest before I'll take any questions you may have. We are lucky enough to be living in a digital age, so use resources like the web to do some extra background research. There's no shortage of information nowadays, but just be sure that you're using reliable resources. Finally, and this is an important one, make sure you discuss ideas with your peers. They're in the same boat as you are after all, and you'll probably find that it helps make your learning more memorable. All in all, take charge of your learning and you'll find that you succeed. Now, do you have any questions before we go on to the next? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.